Ready for this? I'm ready. This is my local store. This is where I buy my comics. Um, so it's just exciting to be here. That's one of the great stores in all of America. And I encourage anyone who's coming out to the DC area, Annapolis, to come here. It's fucking awesome. To coin a phrase. <laughs> Hey there, Third Eye Faithfuls. My name's Kato. I'm here with legendary writer Tom King, and we're here to talk about the new Wonder Woman release. So tell us about your run of Wonder Woman. What makes it so special? I mean, it's as big and as cool as we can make it. It's trying to make a Wonder Woman that is as awesome as her fan base. Our sort of North Star is kick-ass Wonder Woman. Somewhere where you put this thing down and you want to throw a punch, you know? You, yeah. want, you, just, you just you feel like you want to be here. You, you want to fight who she's fighting. You want to uh, uh, cream who she's creating. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. So just get the adrenaline pumping. Just get the, the adrenaline pumping. Yeah. Just have something bad. It's, I mean, I've, I've done a lot of books that are kind of deconstructions, kind of sad dudes looking out windows. <laughs> this is not that. This is about why she is awesome. Yeah, and, awesome. And, and not to put her on a pedestal because she's an easy superhero to kind of just idealize. And then she becomes a little boring, I think, if she's just perfect. Mm -hmm. Like, she's an actual human being. She has actual desires, she has actual flaws, but that all of that stuff just makes her more awesome. So it's not like it's, it's not an idealization of her, but it's how she becomes idealized. So when you're doing your research for Wonder Woman and you're sort of developing Diana's voice, how does that research go and what is your favorite Wonder Woman arc other than your own? I mean, I read a ton. I went back and read, you know, the Golden Age stuff, the Peter stuff. I, I read the Kaniger, very bizarre 50s stuff. <laughs> um, very problematic, the bizarre <laughs> 50s stuff. It dug into the 70s, you know, where she changes costumes and she's doing kung fu. And then you have know, the 80s, the George Perez, which I think is the height of the, to me, the height of it when, when, when George sort of took it over post-crisis. I think those first 12 issues are just so awesome when mm -hmm. she's first fighting, uh, you know, uh, Mars. And that, that, I think that's awesome. And then you, know, then you know, you get the Phil Jimenez, and you get. But I mean, to me, like in terms of characterizations, I love Gail Simone's. I love the warrior, sort of the, like almost the Conan, like Wonder Woman that she brings out, who's so very tough. I think Gail really nailed such a Wonder Woman. Can we get a little insight into your writing process? What does that look like? Where do you usually begin? And how does that go as you move forward throughout the multiple issues? I generally write a book a week, um, if I'm doing it right. Um, I have uh, the three children and a dog, so that takes a ton of my time. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I start on Monday, finish on Friday, like it was a nine to five job. And I take it very seriously in terms of by Friday night, a script will be done. Um, I finish Thursday, edit Friday. And I work whenever I can. It's not like a nighttime, it's not a daytime thing. I have kids, like if there's a back to school thing, I'm about to pick them up, or if there's a doctor's appointment, I have to walk my dog twice a day. Like if there's, life always gets in the way of writing. Writing for me is an addiction. I, I love it more than anything. If I don't do it, I get cheating and crazy. <laughs> so I just, I just have to go back and keep writing, always. How do you feel like you've developed as a writer and how do you think you've changed the most in your process? I mean, in the beginning I was, as most people are in the beginning, I was trying to copy the people I love the most. You know, so I was very much, you know, a kind of Alan Moore-ish clone um, in terms of my ambition. And I was doing a lot of dialogue. I was going after Bendis, which I loved his dialogue. So like, you know, so like Gilmore Girls kind of dialogue uh, that Bendis does so perfectly. Uh, as you go, you kind of you, you, you realize like some of those things are crutches, mm. uh, and sometimes people just point them out like, no, that's bad. You know? <laughs> like, like I was doing so much repetition, you know, like like just these words repeating over, and I was like, mm. I was like, okay, I'm gonna drop that out and give a little more natural dialogue, <laughs> um, less, you know, there's thousands of bubbles, you know, just one or two. And I, also, I also use more words for comics than I used to. I I, I did a lot more silent paneling when I was when I was younger or, or first. It. Now now I use a lot more captions. I use a lot more words. I think people. You know, at, at really, as comics become more expensive and media becomes less expensive, you know, if you get a Netflix subscription for whatever twenty dollars, you have infinite content. You can you buy a comic for five dollars. It needs to be hardy. You need to like actually yeah. take some time to read it. Not just be bored. I think if there's too many words on a page, you're bored and just throw it away and you have to <laughs> pick your phone up. But to find that right balance where you you read the comic and you feel like okay, that took some time. I went through a journey that was worth it to me. I mean, that's like sort of your obligation as a writer to, you know, if someone spent money on this, you have to give them a moment, give them a time, give them a piece of conversation. So, following this idea that you had a lot of, like, um, like dialogue-less panels and you're working with phenomenal artists like Daniel Sampier for Wonder Woman, who just came off of his Dark Crisis run, how does the art process intermingle with the writing process and how does that inspire your work? Well, I, mean, I was very reluctant to take over, to take Wonder Woman. I, it, it, to me, it's like almost like a trap book. It's, it's a place, you know, it, it's easy to fail. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a very hard book to write. Uh, 
and because I, I think sometimes you know even the publisher doesn't take it seriously doesn't doesn't treat her as well as she should be treated and so when they first came to me like daniel was already attached to this book and i was like oh daniel is that's your you know he's your heir to george perez and phil Jimenez. He, he's he's like the new like crisis artist. I was like you are taking this series this is going to be a big book that's, mm -hmm. that is really worthy of this and you're going to put the effort behind it. i was like okay i'm if daniel's in i'm in like he he was the reason i came on this book because i knew he could draw wonder woman in a way um, that would get, you know, as excited as I was when I picked up X-Men number one by Jim Lee. Like that kind of, that Jim Lee, David Finch kind of vibe that he brings to the book is exactly what she needs. It makes her cool, it makes her awesome. Yeah, he captures action and emotion very well, which is like really hard to do both of them. So it's great to see that when you're creating a character who has such depth and is such a badass. And for an ongoing book, as a guy who works with, I've never been the best artist in comics and the people I work with, Daniel's able to do so much, he's very fast. Mm. So like he's gonna do the first five, easily do the first five in a row on this book, and then come back after we take an issue off, probably another five. So that means you get 10 out of 12. Wow. <laughs> I mean, that, that's almost unprecedented in current, in current comics. We, we, got, we had a great lead time, thanks to our great editor, Brittany. Uh, so yeah, that, that, that's what's, I mean, I haven't even done, I mean, I did 85 issues of Batman. I've kind of been on this roller coaster before. <laughs> I've, I've, and I've fallen in some of the pits. I've, done, I've made mistakes. And so I know like how not, hopefully, to make those mistakes again. <laughs> so one of them was getting an artist who could do something like that, 10 out of 12 issues. It's insane. Daniel's so good. So as is evident per your hat, you are a proud resident of Washington, D.C. <laughs> you set Vision, Sheriff of Babylon, and now Wonder Woman in D.C. How does living there inspire your work? I mean, I've been, I grew up in LA, I went to school in New York, I've been in DC now for oh God, over 20 years. All, all three of my children are DC born and raised. And um, yeah, I, I mean, that's just my every day, you know? I, I was writing a fight with Wonder Woman's fighting on, on you know, the mall and the Washington Monument, talking about it with my kids, and we were like, oh, what would you do in that fight? Like, because they know exactly, they're like, okay, the art museum's over there, would you go there and throw Picasso <laughs> in their face? Or, or, oh no, the space, airspace is over there, go there and, you know, get, a, get an airplane and so, like, it, that's where I grew up, and that's where I live, I live in downtown DC, so it just opens up a whole world that I just know it very well. And, uh, you know, of course I was in the CIA, so I dealt with that part of DC when I was, so yeah, all of that stuff continues to inspire me, sort of the, the two faces of the city, that like one of them is kind of this like, you know, nice little mid-Atlantic city, and the other side is like, we are also the center of the power of the entire world, like we have both of those faces, and it's, that's cool, fun thing. And she's always been a DC set character, mm -hmm. so that, that helps, and, um, I also feel that we're a little ignored as a city sometimes. Like people just think of us as the shitty place that politicians go. But that's like such a small percentage of what DC is. I mean, there's four million of us, and there's only like you know 200 of them. So like, I, it's nice to tell the rest of that story. You're bringing two brand spanking new antagonists: the King of America, also known as the Sovereign, and Sergeant Stone. How do you think these antagonists foil the new outlaw version of Diana? It's the, uh, the King of America, his name is the Sovereign. Yeah, no, he's part, he's supposed to be our Lex Luthor, our Joker. You know, it, Diana has, she has Cheetah, so she has a big, a huge villain, but she is also kind of, she's also an ally in a way that Lex Luthor and Joker are not allies to Batman or Superman. Um, so we wanted, I wanted to create something that was as evil as Joker is mm. to Batman. And the idea that there's sort of this, you know, uh, fake U.S. history where there's a president, there's a king of the U.S. that keeps hidden. And the reason he is able to hide it is because he has a lasso of lies, a lasso that makes you believe whatever he says. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I said this before, but my idea of Diana is always as a rebel, as someone against the system. So someone who totally represents the system. Like, I am here so that powerful people can stay in power. And my, that's what my father was, and that's what my grandfather was, and they were all dicks, and I'm a dick, and that's <laughs> the way I'm going to keep running. And she's a, that's what she's utterly against, is, mm -hmm. is that idea that just, like, undeserved powerful people will keep going um so he's he's just the representative of that of the idea that, that the elite are better than you um and, and 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 she's the one who says no thank you and then she becomes an outlaw for it and then she becomes an outlaw for it yes. yeah that's that's our modern society you know <laughs> you say something you know you say something true and good and, and you can get really uh, it can get, go bad for you mm -hmm. and, and but but she, you know she she has her ideals and she sticks to them so i hear you're taking one infamous Oswald Cobblepot in a brand new direction in the Penguin comic. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, what a bizarre life I lead where half the time <laughs> I'm writing literally the nicest, most empathetic person in the DC universe. 
And then the exact opposite <laughs> in Penguin. He's the worst human being in the DC universe. Like, I, Joker's horrible, but he's crazy. You know, he like doesn't quite understand what he's doing, maybe on some level. The, the Penguin is, he's just power hungry. He'll do anything for power. He'll throw his mother under a bus without a second if it helps him. Um, is that something we should keep our eyes out for in the yes, comic? Yes, no, there will be some mother bus throwing. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I, I, this book is, um, I mean, when it came to me with the penguin, I was like, the penguin? Okay, but, but what made it kind of interesting to me is like Batman's whole, you know, a motivation in life is to fight crime. Like, right? that's like the one thing, like his parents said, I'm going to fight crime. And, and he's, I'm one of those stupid people who think that if Batman could be Galactus if he had enough planning. Like, he's mm -hmm. Batman. He can yeah. do whatever. And yet Joker survives and thrives in Gotham as the crime lord. How does that work? How powerful and how smart and how awful must he be? What sacrifices must he be making? to live in a world where Batman doesn't crush him. Mm -hmm. And that to me elevates him almost above any other villain because he's the lord of crime, you know? He's the guy who does exactly what Batman doesn't want and still succeeds. And so finding out why that happened was interesting. And the, the whole idea behind the book is to take that seriously and then do sort of, you know, like your Goodfellas or a Godfather or a Sopranos, but with penguins. <laughs> you know, like, like he's, not, he's, not, I don't know, he's not the top hat, he's not whack, whack, whack. He's the, he's the gangster, he's sitting back <laughs> And you know, pushing pushing the chess pieces, and people are getting killed left and right. While you're telling us some um, about some other titles that you're working on, can you give us a little bit of insight on Animal Pound? Yes, yeah, so Animal Pound is the most ambitious book I've ever written. I always regret writing it. I don't <laughs> think I can. Um, you know, I, I write very superhero. I think this is very literary. It's it's the idea is there's there's a book called Animal Farm. If people don't know, you probably all read it in seventh grade. Uh, <laughs> all written essays about all it. written essays, <laughs> compare and contrast about yeah. them. Yeah, no, it's the whole thing. And um, Animal Farm is is a tale of sort of uh, it was written in world during World War II, the end of World War II, and it, it's about um, how fascism uh, arises from the left. Um, and, and how sort of embracing that ideal leads to, you know, um, losing all of your ideals. Um, and it's sort of always stood as like, what, you know, the snowball of fascism. And so I wanted to write something else that was sort of a different approach, because I don't think that sort of applies today. We're, we're not kind of going from utopians to fascism. People are working not from without the system, but, you know, that's about a revolution, is what the Russian revolution is, but from within the system, um, sort of using, you know, our, our own um, tools of government against us. And so this is sort of a modern day take on what the rise of fascism is today. Again, using animals, like Orwell used animals. Um, but these are animals in a pound, those cats and dogs and rabbits. Awesome. Yeah. And people who frequent your social media know that you love dogs. Love You've them. talked about your dog. And I grew up with cats too. So I've, okay. I've been on both sides. So there's sides. no bias here. No, I, I, yeah, I, I, I was a huge cat person and didn't like dogs as a kid. And, but I thought I had horrible hay fever growing up. It turned out I was allergic, allergic to my cats. Uh, and I had, to, I was, my, I was, you know, I was, like everywhere I went, my cat followed. You know, I do my homework and my cat be laying on the keyboard. Like I was a total cat person. I was allergic to cats. It was horrible. And then when I was when I was older, I discovered dogs. And yeah, dogs are the best thing ever. And that's the best thing God ever put on earth is a dog. Besides, we... besides my wife and children, they're also cool. <laughs> but yeah, they're, yeah they're, all, they're also pretty yeah, all they're right. Also but... pretty all right. So you, you posted a lot of like good morning pictures with your dog, writing pictures with your dog. Can we get can we get a name? Can we get some attributes? Can we get an introduction to who keeps you going? Yes, yeah, so my dog's name is Roxy. She's an absolute terrible dog. I do not <laughs> recommend her to anyone. She uh, she's a rescue dog, she's a pit shepherd mix. Ooh. Um I, I won Eisner for a story I wrote about her called Good Boy, where, mm -hmm. where, where Batman adopts a terrible dog and tries to train. That, that's my dog. She wants to kill every other dog. She pulls on a leash, um, but she, she's she's got she's just a bucket full of love. All she wants is just to like, if I'm ever stressed out, she jumps up, you know, and you know, give me some pets, and you know, she she, she can totally sense it, and, <laughs> and she gets me out of the house, and you know, and I have three children, and she loves all of them. She'll just lie on, she'll just go and lie on my daughter's lap if she's having a bad day. And, Oh. Uh, yeah, she, she's I mean, she's a horrible, horrible dog, and she'll uh, <laughs> like the Joker. She'd throw her mother in front of a bus for a treat. But yeah, she's she's wonderful, <laughs> and she's just she's, she's super cute, and she's getting she's getting up in age. Not color, she's an old lady. So that's <laughs> why I tease her, but she's cool. So when it comes to you know female characters with depth, we know where your inspiration is coming from. It's, <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. <laughs> this rebellious <laughs> nature, we know where this is where this is rooted, and it's Roxy. You I heard it here first. <laughs> I, I went on a USO tour, you know, we're like entertaining the troops kind of thing. Uh -huh. And one of the things you do on the and we were in Kuwait, and, and one of the things you do is they, they show you these sort of attack dogs they're training out there. 
and they do this thing where they, you, you stand there and you get attacked by a dog. You're wearing the whole silly yeah, outfit. Yeah. And the dog's attacking me and he's trying to bite my arm off and he's growling and it just looks just like my dog looks every day. <laughs> so I'm, just, I'm like, oh, you're such a cute little puppy. And the trainer's like, you're the first person to call him a cute little puppy while they're trying to tear your arm off. I was like, what is it? I, I'm used to bad dogs. <laughs> Just getting attacked and picturing Roxy yeah. running a tree. I know, I know. She's like, that's, that's yeah, she's it's good. Oh my, oh God, I just got bit by my dog. This is a sad, sad story. Oh. But so my dog, she hates other dogs and she will fight them if they come up to her. Uh, I think she was mistreated when she was young. Mm. Um, and so we were walking down the street and another dog escaped their leash and jumped a fence and ran at my dog. Holy cow. And uh, this is dog stories of Tom. We're not talking about Tom anymore. And so this dog ran and the owner was way far away uh, and was going too slow and, and and I of course I'm pulling my dog back and my dog will kill this dog and mm -hmm. so I was like crap 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 so and the dog was getting like right in my dog's face and I'm pulling back so I was like oh my dog is about to kill this dog so I, I you know put my leg between the two of them my dog oh went, my boom God. right on my it was because it was either me or the other dog and I didn't <laughs> want to kill a dog so oh my god it took out my leg for like a week so this USO trip actually yes, prepared so it actually, you. It actually, <laughs> yes, yeah. So yeah, that, that's that, that's so um, yeah. So my leg took a hit. Uh, so if anybody ever sees you, with my puppy, <laughs> if anybody sees you walking around with your dog, that is not the time to ask for an no, autograph or an interview. Loves people. Loves okay, people. Good. <laughs> loves, unless you're in yeah, unless you're in my house and you're outside, she loves you. But but yeah, but other dogs, she'll go after you. Yeah. So no fans in a realistic dog suit should approach you. No well. fans in a yeah, that happens a lot. Yeah, it's a cosplay as a dog and she gets really pissed. Yeah. So, time to get serious. We've had enough, oh, crap. enough joking around. Good, I'm, yeah, I'm, good. I'm, I'm ready. Who's the father? Who's Trinity's father? Do you think I'm going to answer that on a... <laughs> no, absolutely not. Now, who's the father? It's not Batman. When is the first appearance of Wonder Girls? Issue 5. They're all in issue 5. We've got a few uh, questions from the Third Eye Faithfuls on our Instagram, at Third Eye Comics. So, Jack Allen Music wants to know, Sure. Do you have a favorite story arc from your Batman run? Uh, yeah, I love the annuals. All the annual, uh, the annuals. I didn't do the annual one has the good dog story. Number two has the beautiful Catwoman story, and number four is kind of the whole big mission statement about about Batman. Yeah, the annuals. The annuals. Cat CS wants to know who's your favorite comic writer right now. Leonard Starr, <laughs> Charles Schultz. <laughs> Who's your favorite comic writer that you'd want to collaborate with right now? <laughs> uh, uh, Ed Brubaker. God, Ed, Ed can't stop doing And Bad Nodar Finger asks, are you okay? No, no I'm not. Have you read my comics? Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> there have been some hints. We've yeah. had some hints. Yeah, no, I recently reread Vision. I was like, oh my god, this guy's really depressed. <laughs> I'm also wrapped up in a lasso, so that can't be good. <laughs> That can't be a good indication no, yeah, of anything. No, that's good. What exactly was your role in the CIA? I mean, it was mostly a No, but like, really, what happened to Kennedy?